And so everyone, as you're coming in, John just put a link to today's agenda is in the chat. So if you click on that, you'll see today's agenda and I'll go over that um, in just a few minutes uh, after everybody is here. Actually, I'm not sure how many we, people we had registered for the meeting. So um, hope people are out enjoying the fall weather. Okay, so I'll wait another minute or so. And we will be taking questions um, for our presenters in the Q&A section, not in the chat, but the chat will be monitored by John, um, who will let me know if there are any questions that I should, um, that I've missed by accident, okay? All right, so let's get started. I'm going to show everyone the agenda, and that way we can just go over what's happening tonight. So uh, after my report, we will have uh, Roberta Rosenberg and Lakshmi Lakshman Prasad, um, Prasad, sorry, Prasad will be speaking to us this evening, and they will be talking about um, about mobility issues while touring and how to how to take care of those. And so it's sort of be a really informative discussion and uh, they will be taking questions from everybody. So when you have a question, please make sure to put it into the Q and A. Um, following the Q and A in our discussion, we will have committee reports. We have five committees presenting tonight and um, it should be a pretty quick meeting. So if anyone has um, any, pressing concerns or something they would like to add to the agenda as new business, as any other business, please put it into the Q&A so we can see it. And we'll be sure to call on you if you need to speak or if you just want to ask it as a question, we can do it that way as well. Okay, so if you do have any, um, any questions or anything specific that you'd like to address, um, please let us know. So I'm going to stop the share a moment. And again, you can get the agenda in the um, link that was sent to all of you. It's in the chat right now. So um, I'd like, I said, John will, John Samlack will be monitoring the chat. Oh, I see some people have just shown up. So we just went over the agenda very quickly for some more of the people who've come in and you'll find the link to it in the, in the chat. We should have time for um, additional business, for new business. We haven't done that. We haven't opened up for new business in a while. But um, this is going to be a, a nice sort of contained meeting and um, we all want to finish because there's a, um, an event tonight, shall we say, that I think a lot of us want to watch and participate in. And uh, we need to get ourselves ready and do a little stretching exercises, have a large drink and then be ready <laughs> for the for the I'm limited to one? That's, that, that's the, my pre-game, that's my tailgating, and then, you know, then the rest. Okay, and um, John, you have something right in front of your camera. Sorry, John, they were going to bar right in front of it. Okay, all right, so President's, um, president's report. Uh, not so much to go over, except a really interesting uh, pr set of presentations last week from the WFTGA, the World Federation of Tourist Guides Associations. Uh, there were three days of presentations, and I heard the, the ones for the first day, the one of the panel that I was on, and it was really fascinating to see and to hear from other guides um, how we're, you know, we're all in the same boat, um, but to see how the different countries and the different governments are reacting to these problems with tourism and the decline of the tourism industry due to COVID-19 and due to all of the different restrictions. Um, it was interesting that in France, the, uh, the French government gave the um, tour guides some government funds some public funds to help them get through this specifically for um, tour guides. And meanwhile, in Israel, the um, tour guides went on a hunger strike and they set up a tent um, in front of the parliament building uh, to speak to their representatives to try to get some assistance. And they re did receive some assistance. They were able to qualify um, for um, some government assistance. And they were also given the opportunity to help um, to sign up to teach. Uh, that was something that was an interesting thing that other tour guides were doing as well, that they were uh, branching out to teaching and to, you know, we are 
basically teaching. And I, I used to be a professor and that's why I love to tour guide because it's like um, teaching again, but you don't have to grade anything. And so it's a great way to, to tell um, kids about their culture and about their history. So that was an interesting pivot. So I really recommend everyone to uh, look at those presentations. Uh, each, uh, each different association presented for about 12 to 15 minutes. And they're from all around the world. So it's really, it's a fascinating thing to see. And so, um, and we're part of the WFTGA. So it's a really good thing to know. Uh, the WFTGA, their biennial conference has been postponed. So they were going to have it in 2021. Now it's going to be moved. And so we won't have um, the meeting Novi Sad in Serbia until another year, year out, 2022. So that's going to shift actually the WFTGA schedule, but we'll be um, keeping you all updated on that when we know more and when I get more news from Alushka, from the president of WFTGA. Now, um, as I said before, it's interesting that many governments um, have, since they have big tourism uh, ministries, they speak, think of tourism in a very different way than what we have here. Um, but here we're lucky because uh, at least in New York, you know, you guys have GANIC and we have Tour Your Own City. And so um, we really hope that that's going well and that you're listing your tours. And if you list a tour and you get a tour booked through Tour Your Own City, please be sure to let um, industry relations know. Okay, so shoot an email to Mike or shoot an email to Bob. Make sure that um, they know that your tour from Tour Your Own City, that um, your posting in Tour Your Own City got you a tour. That's something that we'd really like to be able to keep track of. And let us know your stories um, going out there. What it's like to be touring again. I actually have two people booked for a Central Park tour on, um, on Sunday. And it's going to be my first live tour with bodies that are not friends and family. And so I'm really excited about that. So um, I'd be happy to, you know, let everyone know how it goes. But that's the kind of thing that we'd love to hear. We'd love to hear from you how the tour was, um, how the guests were behaving, and how you felt um, going back to touring again. So please let us know. Please send us photographs. And that'd be something nice to write up for the Virgil. Now, with regards to the Virgil, it is bi-weekly now, and um, we're very uh, happy to do it every other week. And so if you have something that you'd like for the Virgil, I know Peggy sent in a photograph the other day, um, or just yesterday, I think. And so if you have something for the Virgil, let us know. Please just send it to the board. Um, you can also send it to Christina. She is the editor in charge of it, and we'll be happy to uh, we'd be happy to write something out for you. We like keeping people informed. And you can see that you may have seen that Jeremy has already uh, has relaunched the e-newsletter. Okay. And that's the monthly newsletter that was going out um, pre-COVID. And now it's going out sort of, we can't really say post-COVID, I guess it's during um, COVID. So we um, started launching that again. Okay. So that's really it from me. Not, not a lot of big important stuff. Again, please look at the WFTGA presentations. I think you'll find them really informative. And I, I like knowing that everybody else is in sort of the same boat. You, I guess misery loves company, but you know at least what's, what's happening around the world, okay? So um, we're going to start with our presentations. And our first presenter is going to be um, Roberta. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add Mel, who is going to introduce her. So let me just... Um, find Mel and I'll put him on as a panelist. Okay, so Mel, you should be popping up in just a moment. There he is. All right. So Mel, if you unmute yourself and if you, I don't know if you want your camera on or not, but you can unmute yourself and introduce us to Roberta, who will be our first speaker. Okay, so oops, holding on a second while Mel unmutes himself. Okay, there we go. Here we are. Hey, Mel, nice picture. Hi, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker this evening. Roberta Rosenberg is co-founder of Destination Accessible. She and her husband and my wife and I have been friends for most of our adult lives. Roberta grew up in the North Bronx and is a graduate of Evander Childs High School and Hunter College in the Bronx. An elementary school teacher for 40 years as a regular 
classroom teacher in the South Bronx, and then as a beloved ESL teacher in the Great Neck School District on Long Island, where she enhanced a program for her students called World Buddies. This evening, she will tell us about the Destination Accessible website and a nonprofit organization, which, she, which could be valuable in assisting tour guides in offering tours more easily available to a special population, those with mobility issues. Roberta saw how difficult life was for her mother who had recurring mobility challenges as a result of having childhood polio. As her mother aged and needed the use of a wheelchair, things became more difficult. Later, when Roberta's father reached an advanced age, he too was in a similar situation and Roberta was even, even more sensitive to the mobility concerns. Members of this population group have the right to enjoy their lives just as any other, but have to take additional measures to do what able-bodied people take for granted. After she retired from teaching, Roberta also had an accident, seriously injuring her foot, leaving her unable to walk for nearly a year and needing the use of a wheelchair. She had the idea to create a website to help people with mobility challenges then that to navigate their lives more easily and enjoyably. The website offers information at, about the amenities provided at select venues to help accommodate people with these challenges. They would, need, they would know in advance what they will find at these venues, avoiding any surprises. She and a friend developed a successful nonprofit organization and website, this Destination Accessible, which might assist you in preparing for mobility challenged guests on your tours and will encourage you to think differently when welcoming individuals with these challenges on your tour. I'm sure you'll find her talk very interesting and helpful. Roberta. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. Thank you, Mel. Okay, can you hear me? I don't know if I'm muted. Okay, so you're fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me this evening to speak to you. Um, Destination Accessible is a 501c3 organization that's dedicated to enhancing the quality of life for people with mobility challenges. We provide firsthand accessibility information of restaurants, parks, museums, theaters, kid-friendly venues, and other popular places so that people with mobility challenges can know before they go what they're going to find when they get there. And then it's up to them to look at our website. I'm not really going to talk about our website tonight because it's, it's, very, um, it's very easy to navigate. It's very straightforward. And I would encourage you to go on to use it. Um, all of our information is based on personal visits to every venue. Our website is free to all. And as far as we know, there is no other organization that does what we do. So you can, you can go on, you can use it, you can see it. I will say to you, I know you guys are New York City based and most of our information is from Long Island and the New York City area because that's where we are. And so, but you can, you can get a flavor of what it's like. I know that all of you are well versed in the venues that you visit. When you're planning a tour, what do you look for when you visit a venue? Do you think about where you're going to stand so people can hear you? Do you think about uh, how you're gonna get from one location to another? Do you think about how your group is going to be seated or where in a restaurant? Um, I would think that these are some of the things that come to mind. But if you have a person with a mobility challenge, there are many other things that should be thought about. Entrances, ease of navigation, seating, restrooms, to name a few. Before I say any more, I cannot stress enough how important it is for you to check everything out for yourself. Please do not take anyone's word for it unless you have no choice. We have had so many experiences when the information found online and the information gotten over the telephone was not correct. And if I have time at the end, I'll give you an example of that. While it's important to find out about the physical characteristics of the venues that you are visiting, I think that it's also important 
if possible, to get some information about the people on your tour. If you have a private tour coming up and you know who is going to be coming, uh, it really would be a good idea to reach out by email or some other way and see if you can ask about any concerns that people on the tour might have. And so then you have a much better idea of what's going on. If your tour is public and you're meeting the people for the first time, you might want to ask at the outset, you know, about concerns. If you see someone with clearly with a disability, with a cane, who you know is having trouble walking, you might want to engage with them privately to ask about any concerns they may have. And while I realize it's difficult to change things, I think it's important to be upfront with your group about what they're going to encounter and what you may or may not be able to change. If nothing else, when you do this, people will be grateful that you are thinking about them and trying to accommodate them to the best of your ability. And I have to tell you a quick story about when I was still using my cane, we had an opportunity to go to Falling Water, the Frank Lloyd Wright House in Pennsylvania. And I was walking pretty okay, but still needing a cane. And we were taking a public tour. We were trying it. And the tour guide for our particular group came over to me. He noticed that I had a cane. And he, he said to me, you know, I see that you, you, know, you may have some challenges on our route. I'll give you a heads up about where they are going to be. And I'll kind of steer you around to what you can do. And so as we went on it, and he gave me a couple of things, and I was able to handle most of it. But I was so grateful for that, that I just think that anybody in that position would be the same. Life for people with disabilities is not easy, whether your disability is temporary or permanent. Most people with disabilities don't want to make life difficult for others. Any and all effort, efforts to accommodate them are certainly greatly appreciated. When you're visiting a new venue or you're revisiting a venue, uh, it's important to look at them differently. When we go to a venue, we say we are looking at them with destination accessible eyes. And we call them that because usually, if you don't need something, you don't notice it. And my quick story about that is, my best friend lived in the same house for 30 years. I have been to her house hundreds of times. Maybe my second or third week into the wheelchair, we were invited to go there. And my husband said to me, you know, Roberta, there are steps in front of Nancy's house. I said, Mark, you're crazy. There's no steps in front of Nancy's house. My husband being the kind, quiet person that he is, just sort of gave me a look and went along with it. And we got to Nancy's house and guess what? You could, you could know this. There are three steps in front of Nancy's house. Now, in my defense, the three steps are not directly in front of her door. There's a large patio area right in front of the door, and the three steps are from the driveway up to that patio area. I would have sworn on my life that there were no steps in front of her house. So if you don't need it, you don't notice it, you don't think about it. And I think that's one of the most important things about looking at things with different eyes if possible. Now we have a checklist on our website that we use when we visit a venue to make sure that we cover all the things that we feel are necessary to cover. And you can download a copy from our website. I have also given a copy to Emma and I believe that you can get it through her. So it's available and if you're going out, it might be a good thing to have with you. Now I'd like to talk in detail about some of the things that are on, the, are on our checklist and that I mentioned before. Things that you need to look at, a person with a, with a mobility challenge needs to think about when they're going out. And so, and these are the things that are on, that we have, that we stress on our website about each venue. So all of this information about a particular place is there. So first are the grounds, outside areas, if you're meeting in a plaza or a patio or anything like that. Notice, what's the terrain like? Is it hilly? Is it smooth? Is it concrete? What kind of pathways are there? Are there cobblestones? A personal killer of mine. Uh, grass, gravel. Is there any seating available for someone who might need a quick rest? Entrances, when you're going into the main entrance, 
Will that be difficult for someone with a cane or a walker? Is the entrance street level? Are there any steps to get up to it? How many are there? Is there a handrail? Is there a push button assist? Is it an automatic door? Is there a ramp? Where is it? Is there a separate handicapped entrance? If so, where is that entrance? Would it be easy to send someone to that entrance to get in and meet you? Or might it be better, if possible, to take everybody through that door if, you're, if one of your people has a mobility challenge? Once you get inside, how easy is it to get around? What's the flooring like? Is it wood? Is it stone? Is it carpet? Does it change? Is it someplace where a person might trip? Um, <clears throat> I know, excuse me, at the Frick Collection, there are several galleries that have really thick carpet or rugs, I'm not sure which they are, which I had a lot of trouble navigating with my cane. Um, you know, perhaps you could go to another gallery. Now, if you need that gallery, that's one thing, but I'm just saying that these are things that you might want to consider. And so, um, you know, maybe you could use another gallery. Inside, are there steps, are there ramps, are there elevators? Where are they? How many are there? Um, you know, if you're going up the steps, is there a ramp nearby that somebody could use? Or would it be better for you to take the whole group up that ramp to make it easier for one particular person or everybody? Galleries, aisles, is there, is there enough space in them? I, I realize most of them are large, but, but I've been in a lot of places where they're not so large. Do the galleries have seats? I know that some galleries have benches. Some galleries don't have benches. Perhaps if your tour involves someone like that, you could, um, I think if I've thought about it as having like a plan A and a plan B, or maybe even a plan B and a plan C, depending on who your group is, if you could change some things. So it's just things to think about. So, you know, galleries, seating, when you stop to speak, is there some place for people to sit down? Uh, could you change your location to accommodate those with challenges? Um, you know, when, certainly I'm sure that you all do that when you stop and there are places to sit, you know, encouraging people to let those who need to sit, like us seniors, um, have a seat. So, you know, think about varying your route, if at all possible. Restrooms, a particular favorite of mine. It's really important that you know where the restrooms are and what they're like where the handicapped restrooms are. I know that in, not in, in some facilities, the handicapped restrooms are not in the same location as you know, the multi-stall restrooms. I, I believe I remember at the Guggenheim, the, the um, handicapped restrooms are an Annex 7 or something, and also on the lower level. A person with a disability might not ask about that, but it might be a good idea to mention it in terms of mentioning restrooms that, you know, oh, if you need a handicapped restroom, here's where you can find it. And certainly be prepared to explain how to get there. And, you know, notice what kind they are. Um, if, it's a, if it's a single occupancy restroom, if it says family restroom, unisex restroom, if it has both man and a woman on the door, those restrooms, single occupancy restrooms, are almost always handicap accessible. They're almost always large and they're almost always, you know, good. I know that I, I'm pretty sure, I don't know this for sure, at the Frick and at the Morgan, uh, handicapped restrooms are sort of tucked in between galleries rather than the main restrooms on the lower level. Dining venues, restaurants, besides, you know, entrances, ease of navigation, restrooms. It's important to know how far apart the tables are. Now this, I'm not talking about COVID. All of this information and stuff is pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID. But if you're going to a restaurant, um, it's important to know how far apart the restaurant, the uh, seating is. And I will say that when I was in a wheelchair, one of the most disturbing things to me was we would go into a restaurant, my husband would push me in, and we would get dirty looks from some of the people who had to move their chairs two inches so the wheelchair could get by. So something to think about, you know, if you know a restaurant's going to be tight, perhaps you could talk to that restaurant before you get there to accommodate someone who perhaps can't walk that far, would be better off in a different seat, or someone who needs a little more space. 
theaters. Well, if we ever go to theaters again, um, there are yet other things to consider in theaters. Where's the handicapped seating? I know that almost every restaurant, uh, every theater now has wheelchair and companion seating available. But what about people who are not in a wheelchair, but who can't navigate the steps well? Are there any seating that does not require steps going up or down. Um, a great venue, which is closed, the Nassau Coliseum, has in each of its sections, their back row does not require any steps. You can get to that area and you do not have to go up or down any place. That's a great thing. It's not advertised, but something to know about. I found out about it from a tour, you know, so. Seating. How wide are the aisles? Can people get up and down easily? Do the aisles have handrails? Do they have lighting? How steep are the steps to the aisles? That could be a big item for some people. Are there elevators to the upper levels? I know that a lot of theaters don't have elevators. And, and again, where are the restrooms? Oh, you know, I know that probably half of the New York City theaters now have a handicapped restroom in their um, orchestra level. People don't know about it. They don't advertise it really. It's, it's there, but it's not there there. And so um, it's, it's hard to know about many of these things. And they are things that people just don't necessarily ask about. Or if you call up and you go online, the information is not necessarily there and not necessarily correct. That's another issue. So one of the things that I haven't mentioned is you're going from one location to another. So you're, you have a walking tour, certainly going many places. And if you are giving a walking tour, uh, it might be wise for you to look at the, the streets, the terrain that you are going to be you know, tra traversing. The city streets, do they, you know, are all the streets you're going on have curb cuts for somebody who needs it? Um, are, are you going on places that have cobblestones? Are the, are the um, areas that you're going to be on, grass, gravel, you know, whatever else there is in the city. Perhaps when you're planning your walking tour, you could plan to stop at locations that have seating for somebody. Um, how's your pace? Can everybody, you know, the, the slowest person stay up with your group? That might be something that's important to your group. And these are all things that are, that are pertinent to someone with a mobility issue, whether they're a senior, a slow walker, a person with a heart condition, a person who uses a cane or a walker, or a person in a wheelchair, which is a, you know, I'm sure Lakshmi will talk about. But I have tried to give you an overview of things that we believe are important to think about and look at when you're leading a group that has one or more people with a mobility challenge. And I would suggest that if you have time, it would be a good thing to do even if you're not having somebody immediately so that all of a sudden, if it comes up, you will be prepared. And as I said, I am sure that anybody with a, with a mobility challenge will be grateful for your thinking of them in any way. And even if you can't do something specific for them, um, you know, tell them what you can do and they will, I'm sure, be grateful for all of your concern. Great, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank I'm you. Questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Roberta. Yeah, and I, there's some questions coming into the Q&A already. And so we'll, when Lakshmi is finished speaking, then I'll, um, then we'll open it up for discussion. But this is really great to know. And just if people didn't miss it in the chat, the, um, Roberta sent me her checklist and I will be posting that into the GANIX, um, into GANIX document section of the website. So everyone can just go and see it. You can download it, you can print it out and you can go through it um, to speak to the venues before you go there. Okay, so thank you again, Roberta, and stand by because we've got questions. All right, but Nick, now we're to um, speak to um, Lakshmi, Lakshmi Lakshman Prasad. Um, Lakshmi has been working on her family's blog since um, 2018, and when they embarked on a journey to explore New York City. Um, her sister Annie uses a wheelchair because of her cerebral palsy, um, but she still wants to explore New York City and her family does that by getting around and about in our city and seeing what parts of it are truly accessible and welcoming. 
Um, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, passed over 30 years ago, but still there are accessibility issues. And so Lakshmi is drawing attention to them, and her blog is wonderful to read, and she writes beautifully too, so it's great to read of her stories. And she's really inspiring for um, visitors, whether they're local, whether they're coming from overseas. One day they will come from overseas again, and to help them get in and around our city. Now, as Mike mentioned at the beginning, um, he, we were speaking um, just prior to the meeting, um, Mike got to know Lakshmi because of her work with NYC and company. And um, then Bob Gelber, our other vice president, sort of a dual work of our vice presidents, helped us um, bring her to speak to us. So um, Lakshmi, if you want to go ahead and just let me know when you want me to put your video and your website up. Um, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all so much for having me here this evening. Um, well, Roberta, that was a phenomenal job. I think you've covered it all. So we can say good night and go home and get ready for the debate. <laughs> um, so our journey started really two years ago. Um, but prior to that, I had been in um, marketing, uh, digital marketing, particularly as um, destination marketing here in New York City. Um, my entire career, which allowed me to travel to many, many destinations far away from New York um, for family vacations. And one of the things that I've lived in anguish over my entire life, it's the fact that I couldn't travel with my mom and sister. My sister was born with a severe cerebral palsy and really needs her wheelchair. So vacations were just not an option for us. And two years ago, you know, we were dealing with some really, really difficult time and we wanted to just get out of our homes, uh, be out in public and enjoy one of the greatest cities in the world. And that's when I started looking around to see, well, what, what do people with disabilities do when they come to New York City? I mean, we're one of the top destinations across the entire world. Everybody wants to come here. And I'm sure people with disabilities wanted to come. And it was at that point, I realized that there just wasn't a lot of information out there for people with disabilities. And me myself as a marketer had marketed New York City as a destination for all kinds of travelers, group, FIT, um, just every kind you could think of, but I've never thought about it from the perspective of a person with a disability. And I find that that is a general consensus with much of society where they really think that people with disabilities aren't out and about in public. And so they're usually an afterthought. And I contacted various organizations to see who was actually, you know, taking charge of um, just marketing it from a wheelchair user's perspective and every organization that I knocked on their doors or contacted kept sending me all around. And so I said, okay, so nobody wants to do it and I'll, I'll do it. And that was when I told my family this crazy idea of let's go visit everything we can in New York and let's blog about it. Let's just put it out there because Besides the fact that you don't have reliable information, there is also a complete lack of representation. You don't see people with disabilities in mainstream media. And when you're not represented, you don't know how truly welcomed you are. And so we've set out with the top 20 attractions across New York, um, going to all of them, photographing ourselves because I certainly didn't have any other models. and. Um, my children were all on board. My husband was like, you're crazy, but we'll do it. And that's how we started the blog. Um, and then from there onwards, I was kindly introduced to NYC and company where I talked to them about representation, talked to them about their accessible NYC area where it lacked certain content. And I got a wonderful partnership with them. So without much ado, um, Emma, can you please show the video? The sound is off.
Okay. And Lakshmi, let me know if you want me to show your website too. I'd be happy to do that. I just want to ask quickly, was everyone able to hear the entire video? Because I only read through um, the captioning. There was no sound. Sorry, guys. I'm not sure what, how, why it didn't come through. So do you want me to show it again? Yes, please, if it's OK. Because it gives a lot of. Um... Let me check. Let me check my mic again. Hold on a yeah. second. My apologies, because I think it was my mic. Okay. All right. Sorry, it's just not now. It's of course it's not coming up. Here we go. Okay, trying again. Right. New York City presents challenges now is it all right? for visitors with disabilities, but you can easily get around with a little advice. Okay. Hi, How's I'm that? Lakshmi Lachman Prasad. My mom is Pearly Lachman. My sister Annie is a wheelchair user. Annie was born with cerebral palsy. We've been trying to bring her out more often. I've created a blog called AccessibleTravelNYC.com to showcase experiences from a wheelchair user's perspective. Most of New York City subway stations are not yet accessible. However, all MTA buses are wheelchair accessible. Taxis are a great way to travel around New York City. To book a yellow taxi, the city offers an app called Accessible Dispatch. The ferry is another great way to explore Brooklyn and Queens from Manhattan. <laughs> Annie says there is so much to see in New York City. There are so many attractions here and most of them are wheelchair accessible. It's best to always contact visitor services. Usually there is a specific telephone number and email. If you're out and about and you're looking for a wheelchair accessible restaurant, look in their window, see if you see a wheelchair accessible icon. And then if we want a fancy meal or a nice meal, we typically scout out a restaurant and then call them to find out if they're accessible. We love seeing Broadway shows. Annie especially enjoys them. All theaters in New York City are wheelchair accessible. We'd like to recommend visiting theateraccessnyc.com. You get orchestra seating at a lower price, and that's for you and your caretaker. Because our city is so friendly and our attractions and cultural institutions are accessible, it's just a wonderful place to visit. Okay, sorry about that before. It's okay. Thank you so much. Um, okay. I, I wanted you to rerun it because it contains just such a great overview of how to get around the city. And of course, back then, theater was the biggest thing that existed. And so we focused on theater and restaurants. Um, so thank you for that. Um, well, Roberta actually covered quite a lot um, to do with wheelchair access in physical spaces and talked about street levels and curb cuts. So I'm not going to take up any time with that. But a couple of things I wanted to point out that I actually have made some notes on. Um, it's that first off, I wanted to let everybody know that it's a huge market out there. It's actually about 60 million people within the United States that identifies with a disability. And it's worth over $490 billion. So that's quite a large market to target. Um, then uh, when Emma and I spoke, we, um, she asked if I can interject with a little bit of information um, for people who are hard of hearing or who's blind. So I actually have a blind friend and colleague of mine, Peter Slayton. And so I've gone through quite a bit of the city with him. And from his perspective, I mean, if he was doing a tour, I think he would enjoy rich 
uh, descriptive languages. And even though he may not be able to see what's happening, the description will help him. And um, things like food tours would be absolutely phenomenal for people who are visually, um, who are visually impaired and on the blind spectrum. And for those who's hard of hearing or deaf, I would actually like to suggest that you, you know your tours, you know your roots, you know your speech along that way. It would be great if you were to put the information together digitally and share it with them ahead of time if you know that a hard of hearing or deaf person wants to join the tour. The other thing is that although people aren't deaf, um, hearing it's also on a spectrum, um, what you can do is that especially in older adults who might be hard of hearing, whenever you're speaking, ensure that they're looking directly at you and just speak clearly. You don't have to speak at a slower pace. Just speak as you would normally do. And those were actually the only tips um, that I had for you um, for those who are blind and or deaf. And something else to keep in mind, it's actually um, just how we have mobility issues for older adults or people who are wheelchair users. If you're having a family with you and a parent has a stroller child, they sort of rely on the same access um, that wheelchair users and people with mobility issues have because uh, parents typically with younger children would appreciate keeping their child in their stroller instead of picking them up, folding up the stroller and going into a restaurant. So those are just some more of the things to be mindful for when you're welcoming people with disabilities. And since I have a digital marketing background, one of the questions I asked Emma is where does everybody get their um, bookings from? And she did mention the website, which I took a quick look at. Obviously, if I I filtered tours to see what was available for me and my sister to do. And I believe there might just be one tour that's labeled as handicap. And I wanted to point out that that language has sort of shifted these days. It's um, more people with disabilities instead of handicap. So there's more uh, positive languaging that can be used. And for all of the tour guides on here tonight, if you're really thinking of attracting and serving and welcoming this market, I'd implore you to please take a look at your pages, update your languages, um, and you know, just let people with disabilities know that you're there, you're capable of welcoming them on the tour, that you've given some thoughts as to how you can make it more accessible and inclusive. And please ask, um, just as Roberta said, ask ahead of time if anybody needs any special accommodations that you can plan ahead for. And I believe, you know, when, when you have a website that's um, attractive with good language, um, it, it just makes it much more enticing for a person with a disability and much more welcoming to know that they're going to have a good overall experience. And that's what sets you apart from the other tour guide that might be offering the same type of services. And with that, I would like to end because the question and answers are always the best part of these. Most definitely, most definitely. And one thing I want to say, and uh, just to let everyone know, I mean, I did when Lakshmi and I spoke and um, like she mentioned the website, I left it deliberately without making any changes so we could talk about this right here. I didn't want to go in and fix everything so we, we look good because it's, it's something that, and Roberta said this very well, if you don't need it, you often don't think about that. And when I had foot surgery and I had my mobility issues, all these things came to me that I had never thought about before. So it's really a question of becoming aware. So I'll just go through the questions. And um, Emma, just one, one quick thing to point out. Um, I, I didn't go into a lot of details, but um, on the blog itself, there's quite a bit. If you go to the accessibility tips for each one of the places we visited, it's sort of the things to look out for at that destination. And um, I've been working with NYC and company in doing neighborhood guides. 
So there's one for Lower Manhattan and there's one now for City Island. So if, if you were to just quickly take a peek at the accessibility guides, um, just please, um, it, it will be the things that you, you would know what to look for when you're doing your tours. And thank you for the person who just pointed out, um, not blind, but visually impaired. Yes, there's right languaging to address each one of the disabilities and they're all spectrums with a wide range. Yeah, that's definitely something to keep, to keep in mind. That's why we're really happy to have both of you here to draw attention to these issues. Now, some of the questions, I can sort of bundle them together. And I think this is um, uh, for, well, really to both of you, but especially Roberta, because you have a list of all the venues. And um, do you update this list um, if, they, if they've changed their accessibility? Do you contact them to see what accessibility has been changed? And how do you select a venue to appear on your list? Okay, so two part, a two part question. Uh, the first part about updating is um, updating, I will have to say, is on a catch-as-catch-can basis because um, at the moment I am a single person doing this. And so um, we'd love to get some volunteers who would help us. But at the moment, um, our information is based on the date that's there. And we are trying to update and trying to enter new places and we're doing the best we can. So a person who's going to the website can see the date that we were there and can see how recent it's been and what has happened. And some of them have had updates and you can see those dates as well. And so the other question was, I forgot. Yeah, uh, <laughs> what was the other question? No, about, about listing them, how do you select which ones are listed? Listing, listing them, um, not, so, so we, we do not only list places that are extremely accessible. Our, our venues that we have are based on recommendations of places we should go, places that are interesting, places that people have had a good experience and have told us about, uh, places that we have visited, you know, just that we're going to. Um, and so again, it is, you know, we're happy to take, we're happy to take any kinds of recommendations but we have places on there that are not all that accessible. And as I said before, you know, everybody's needs are different. If you are a slow walker, but you can do steps, then a place that has steps will be accessible for you. If you, you know, have a walker and you can't do that, then, you know, it's, um, it's a different story. So our, that is why our website is strictly informational. We don't give stars, we don't give you know, little canes or whatever. The information is out there. You look at it and see how it fits your needs. Okay, so, there, so there's no um, rating system, like you said. And if guides have places that they would like to recommend, um, for example, one of our, um, actually one of our board members does tours at Lincoln Center, and which ha they have a specific way of conducting tours for people who are differently abled. And so can they um, reach out to you both to be listed? Um, yeah, <laughs> Kevin, I hope I asked the question correctly. Yeah. We have we have not we have not done Lincoln Center. Uh, it's not a place that we that I have been to and recently, you know, to to since since beginning this organization. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, certainly we'd like to with COVID, everything is at a standstill. And it's, um, you know, it's hard. Look, I, I would say that and, and Lakshmi can can I'm sure um, give more input into this that large venues, you know, um, the Museum of Natural History, Carnegie Hall, although Carnegie Hall until recently did not have such great information on their website. Um, you, you, can, you can sort of count on large venues having correct information. But again, it's still not, you know, all encompassing. When you, you know, when you talk about, you know, that a restaurant has a handicap accessible um, sign on it, it doesn't necessarily mean that their, that their restroom is handicap accessible. Um, we've been to places in New York City where that's the case. And so it, it's sort of in, I feel that it's incumbent upon you to get the most information you can personally. Right. And that's what we have tried. That has been our goal to, to give this information that we have seen and putting it out there so that people can count on it and not have, um, 
you know, not have surprises. Um, quickly, I'll say last year when my husband was in a wheelchair and we were going to this club that we were invited to and I called up. And the gentleman who was an owner said, no problem getting in, you know, it's fine. We'll seat you on the main level. The restroom is on the same level. It will be fine. And sure enough, the, the entrance was fine. We were able to, you know, our seat was fine. And then my husband needed to use the restroom. And as we walked down, as I pushed him down the hallway to the restroom, I'm thinking this hallway is really narrow. And when we got in front of the restroom door, I was thinking this door is really narrow. And one, there was no way to turn the wheelchair, but it didn't matter because when the door opened, there was no way that a wheelchair was fitting into that space. Now, there were handrails there. So I guess that the, the, the owner thought that made it handicap accessible, but that's not enough of a story. And so he didn't probably ever need it for that. And so it was not an issue for him. So it speaks to our, um, our interest in seeing everything before we write about it. Yeah, and Lakshmi, what, how would- what Roberta would... is correct. That is absolutely true. Um, it, it, somebody would tell you that they're wheelchair accessible, but you get there and they're not. I'm, I have another example um, based on what she's saying, um, the cloisters. So we'd gone through quite a bit of the big attractions in, in the city and, you know, I took it for granted that if they said that they were accessible, that meant, you know, we would have a great experience and we got there only to find out that the front entrance isn't actually where the wheelchair goes through, that you actually have to get into a van and the driver drives you around to another corner and that's where the entrance is. I mean, you don't put those things into consideration if you don't know that that's what the case is and we have specific drop off and pickup times. You don't allocate an extra half an hour to be driven around. And the other thing with them, it's that they have a tiny, tiny, um, elevator and Annie's wheelchair was barely able to fit in there so the elevator door it's barely 26 inches so if you have a tour going there and the wheelchair is bigger than 26 inches you're not getting to see the entire museum so all of those are small specific things mm -hmm. that I they they, they can ruin an experience if you're not prepared for them. And I believe it's the same with the Fricks elevator, that it's really small. Um, and some wheelchairs are over 600 pounds, the ones that, um, well, not manual, the electric wheelchairs, those would never make it up in the small, tiny elevators. So those are all things to consider. Um, Roberta's gone through quite a lot. I've gone through quite a lot in the city as you're putting to your tours together. If any of the guides want to reach out with specific questions, I'm happy to help them yeah, and along so the way. Have you, have you reached out to these venues when you have found these problems and said, you know, this needs to be fixed? I mean, I did have a, a guide mention to me, well, you know, if, if it does say it's, AD, it's ADA accessible, but it's not really like you said, the restrooms or the elevators aren't, they don't fulfill the, it's sort of like lip service to it, but when somebody actually has to use it, you know, so. Yeah, you, I, I reached out to their visitor service and I said, you know, the information is misleading. You need to change it. And um, I don't think they've changed the language in. I think they felt that they were covered by saying, please contact us for more information. So um, there's that. And I remember going over to Luna Park where we thought we had just done the Bronx Zoo, which they have wheelchair accessible attractions. And I thought, hey, Luna Park, you know, I can get on a carousel with my sister, that would be fun. And the language in on their website suggests that they have wheelchair accessible rides and attractions, but you get there and then they're offering me, well, I can lift your sister onto a ride and store your wheelchair. And I'm like, that's not the access we need. So it, it's really, truly the case where you have to do your homework. You have to know what to ask for. You have to know that person with a disability's needs so that you can ask the venue the right question if you're not going in there with a measuring tape yourself to measure it. Right. So it's really, I mean, guides and we, we all, I mean, I think one of the sort of tour guide mantras is, you know, to be prepared. If we're doing, I know me personally, and I know a lot of the guides who are listening, if you're doing a walking tour, if you're going out to a new neighborhood, 
you walk it yourself. And, and I think it really behooves the guide to, you know, maybe we should all start thinking about our tours in a different way. So when we're on the tour, we know what to, we know what to do. And this was something that came up um, when, when, with one of our um, discussions when Lakshmi and I spoke before this is um, how you greet your guests. And um, Lakshmi, maybe you can speak to that of how, you know, when you, when people don't realize perhaps someone is going to be differently abled and the reaction you get and how, how does that make you feel? And how does that, how does your family interact in that way? So um, you get there and I try to alert everybody ahead of time, especially restaurants on our, our specific seating arrangements. I put it in open table, I call them, I follow up, I do all of that because the last thing you want is to get there and then they look at you as if they don't know, well, what, what do I do with you? And then there's this uncomfortable feeling where, you know, they're really trying to ensure that we have a good visit, but it's already like, well, you didn't know what to do with me when I got here and now we're left with that heavy feeling. Um, so one of the, this is why too, you know, on your website, just start looking at your tours differently. Look at them from an accessible point of view. Just look at your roots, look at, look at everything because you're an expert in your tour. Look at them from a wheelchair user's perspective or if a person who's blind or if a person who can't hear wants to join that tour and, and just do that route yourself. Look at it that way and then update the languaging on your website and you know where your shortfall is going to be within your tour. I think it's also good to clearly state, you know, what you think that sh uh, shortfall might be it's so that the person on the other end as roberta says it's a spectrum um some people can get out of their chair some people can do one stair some people are using you know a walker they can then decide if if they'll manage to do you know this tour and book it with you it's transparency that helps the situation and it's it's leaving a space or a box that says please let us know if you need any other accommodations mm -hmm. And I know you spoke before about um, people with um, vision, um, vision disabilities. I know at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, for example, they had the tour for the visually impaired with objects that could be touched. And so that was a special tour that we booked ahead of time. And, you, and there were certain objects, I think some of the labels have been removed by now, but they were certain objects that said, you know, this may be touched by those with um, vision impairment. And so they could experience the art um, in a tactile way instead of um, vision. And I'm sorry, Roberta, I saw your I saw your hand was up. You had. A... I, I just wanted to make a comment about the ADA, because we, many of us, assume that the ADA, um, anybody who who follows the ADA guidelines and abides by them, is you know everything is fine, and that is not the case. The ADA, from from my perspective and from my looking, is like sets the bar. It's kind of like the lowest bar. And there are so many other things that um, you could meet the ADA guidelines, but you could, uh, you know, you could not be truly accessible. And there is no one anymore that is checking that. Um, it used to be that towns could go in and you could, you could call someone or you could write a letter and a town or someone would go in and sort of cite them or tell them they have to, you know, upgrade something. That has changed and there is nothing that anybody is going to do unless you as the person going there then writes them a letter, like a certified letter. They have 90 days to respond to your letter. Supposedly they have another 90 days to fix it and then another 90 days to let you know. And then from what I know, nobody does anything about it anyway. Now, do you have also this, this sort of goes actually because a question came up. Is there a template to write these questions or is there something? What do you mean? Is there, a, is there a specific form that needs to be filled out for these kinds of? Um, I don't think so. The attorney, the disability attorney that I spoke to about it, he didn't, and he didn't indicate anything like that. I don't know. I guess I could find out. But it seems like as time has gone on that this, these particular items have fallen way down on the list of importance for, 
for places. And certainly now that places are trying to survive, you know, that's another whole thing. But, but I would like to mention one other thing that I think I saw in the chat, someone said most restaurants have um, a, a, a handicap accessible restroom on their main floor. And that is, that is not necessarily true. And I will tell you about a restaurant, a fine restaurant near Carnegie Hall, which shall go unnamed, that whose only restaurant is down a flight of 16 stairs. Mm -hmm. And when asked about what do you do for someone you know, who can't do the stairs, their answer was, and I quote, we send them to the restaurant next door. Wow. So, you know, it's not on their website, certainly, and they're not telling you. And I guess if you called up and asked specifically, you might find out about it. But, you know, be forewarned that, that every, you know, unless you see it for yourself, you cannot, you cannot be sure that it's so. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one quick question was, um, is, have you, there are some uh, universities that have travel and tourism programs, and, and this might be a good thing to contact those programs about to make sure that they're covering accessibility issues. That was more of a comment than a question. But then um, this is a sort of a big one. Because of COVID and because of what we're going through today, are there things that have, have been changed that you have noticed have been changed? For example, um, how do you know that the, um, the, uh, the taxis that you're calling with the app to make sure that they're clean, that the person is masked? I mean, there, there are all those kinds of safety concerns um, too. So have you, have you encountered any of that yet, either of you, Lakshmi? All right, I'll take a stab at that one. So in, because I'm on the steering committee with NYC and company, they have a safety pledge. And what they've done is that they've reached out to a lot of organizations to take this pledge so that guests feel are rest assured that when they come visit New York or if you get out of your house, if you're a local tourist, um, that everything has been cleaned and in place. Um, so organizations have taken the pledge across the city, which you can find on NYC and company's um, website. Um, and in terms of changes, I find that, you know, there's a couple of good things that came out of it. So now if we want to go to a restaurant, we are enjoying our time on the outdoor space. I don't have to worry if we're gonna get through the door unless we know that we'll probably need to use the restroom at that stop. And there's wider space now on the sidewalk. So we're not back to back in a restaurant where somebody might, you know, accidentally hit the chair or we're bumping into somebody along the hallway. And the other good thing is that we don't have high tops anymore outside because sometimes you'd get into a restaurant and you're like, oh my gosh, it's all high tops. We can't sit here. So that's one good thing. The other good thing that's come out of it, it's the um, contactless menu where most restaurants now are putting their menus online. So my blind friend can check out that menu ahead of time and or his screen reader on his phone can read the menu to him. Whereas before we had all outdated PDFs that just wasn't okay. So those are, you know, some of the positives that's come out of this Terrible, terrible times. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's just a little silver lining. Yeah, Roberta. I would like to say in terms of um, things changing, that in going out to, well, the only place we've gone really are restaurants or even some parks and outdoor places. I'm not, I'm not particularly ready to go indoors. Uh, but what I have noticed about businesses in general is that venues that you go online and they have a lot of information about what they're doing for COVID to keep not only their patrons safe, but their employees safe. The more information a venue puts online on their social media for you to see, when you get there, you actually see it in action as opposed to places that have next to or nothing, except for the little um, you know, New York State COVID thing at the top. Those places are not as good. And the the you know, the, the, the word is, if you go someplace and it looks the way it looked before COVID, you don't want to be there. It's good advice. That's good advice. Tip. That's just a tip for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, ladies. This is really 
inspiring, very thoughtful, provoking and interesting to have you um, speaking here. And I actually had one of um, uh, Sandy, Sandy Wasserman asked um, if guides have stories to tell about um, working with and, and having guests who have mobility issues or other um, disabilities to share them with us. And so you're welcome to have it. We can have a discussion also on the GANIC website or in, in our um, GANIC Facebook group. You know, telling these kinds of stories really helps us too, because then we also get the information. I mean, I have, I like I said, I have a live um, Central Park tour on Sunday and I'm going to walk it tomorrow and I'm going to be looking for the things that you ladies just mentioned. I want to check and see. So if one of my people shows up and perhaps they have some mobility issues, I know how to deal with them. So it's really, this is really very, very good. So thank you both so very much. And so, um, yeah, Lakshmi, go ahead. I have one, I have just one quick question and it's a question I like to ask the audience. Is there anything that you're afraid of as a guide um, in welcoming people with disabilities on one of your tours? Yeah, um, that's a great, that's a great question. That I, I can try to help. Put that, in, put that in the chat. Is anybody, is there anything that you're, that you're worried about? And um, it's interesting because Lakshmi and I, we, we, when we spoke before, and I know she came with her family to um, One World Observatory. And I know when, uh, when I was still giving tours there, we would prepare ourselves way ahead of time. And so we all knew that if we had um, someone in a wheelchair, if we had, you know, a, a double wide stroller was always my, my heart sunk whenever I would see a double wide stroller. <laughs> I was worried about getting into the spaces. But we, you know, the, the tour guides there, the tour ambassadors there, we had our way of, of communicating with each other right away. So we would not want to make our guests feel uncomfortable, but we could take care of them ahead of time. Yes, so Hardy is really good. Um, they're Matt Baker too. Their biggest worry is failing to satisfy or being afraid of people who show up and they don't tell you before that they may have a disability issue. You know, you get that surprise and you're just like, wait, what to do? So if, it, if, it's, um, if it's a small group, and I'm assuming now we would only be de dealing with small groups, then I would actually speak to the tour guide on the side. Um, if I go somewhere and I can tell that that person doesn't know how to work with my sister, um, then it, it's just easier for everybody if you're on the same page. So... In my case, I mean, I would be comfortable talking to the guide on the side because, as I said, you know, you, you read bo body language right away um, within the space that you're in. And, you know, it all comes back to this lack of representation where the person with the disability stands out tremendously and the other person just doesn't know what to do. So ask, um, ask. Mm -hmm. Ask if there's anything you can do. And if you don't feel comfortable talking to somebody on the side, just ask, what can I do as I start this tour to make you more comfortable as a general question, because obviously you cannot single out the person with a disability and ask them. Yeah. Is there any language you would use to help make people feel less on the spot and to help make them feel more comfortable and maybe to help the other guests on the tour be more empathetic? Ooh, so the other guest on the tour, see, that's, a, that's an educational um, session right there because I find that they use language and that's really just not um, up to standards. What I can do is that um, I actually have a guide of language usage. I can send it to you. You can share it with all of the guides. So that way to in their own language and, and as they think about language for their web pages, um, it will just help everyone. Uh, create a more welcoming atmosphere there. That's perfect. That's be that would be just what just what we need. That that's something that really would be important. And everything um, that Lakshmi and Roberta are sharing with us, we will have all the links up. We'll have any documents and everything ready for you all in the next couple of days because. Um, that way we can really take advantage of it and, um, and you know, improve our tours and, and definitely improve the GANIC website first thing first. Okay. All right, great. So any final comments and, and we'll just... Well, I'm really happy that you've invited us to have this talk so that everybody can be at ease. And I'm really, really happy here again to be 
with you all this evening because I really do believe that NYC and company will try to do um, the appropriate things in welcoming uh, visitors with disabilities and have it more integrated um, in their marketing campaign going forward. So hopefully we'll all be ready. Hopefully, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you all very much for listening and I hope that we were able to be helpful to you. Yeah, it was great. It was great. So um, that was definitely, definitely really important information, really inspiring and interesting to hear. So you both are welcome to leave the meeting, but I can also just put you as um, attendees uh, if you want to stay so you can look at the chat and we will be um, moving on to the rest of the meeting itself. So what I'll do now, let me just get my agenda, um, but I will put you both as attendees so you're free to stay um, as as long as you'd like. So hold on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Just just a moment. So, okay. Thanks. Maybe I'll go through the chat and then I'll jump off. Sure. Mm -hmm. To see if there's any yeah. questions I missed. Yeah. That's perfect. Okay. So Roberta, I'm changing you now to attendee. Thank you so much for coming. And now, um, let me see. So Lakshmi, I'll change you to an attendee as well. All right. Perfect. Um, that was really. That was great, and I'm, I'll, I will have, make sure everything is posted and everything is there. So um, since the, they're, um, both Roberta and Lakshmi are still around and they'll be in the chat, so please feel free to ask some questions there. So now we're going to our committee reports. Our first person reporting will be Mr. Baker. And Matt, let me just find you, and I will put you on as a panelist, and you will be, you're good to go. Alrighty, can you hear me okay? Yeah, but you're sideways. Am I sideways? Hold on a sec. There you are, that's much better. Is that better? Okay, see, I always wow, hold my phone the wide way. I'm just... uh, no, this is a bird's nest, actually. I've been, <laughs> alrighty. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. Um, the awards committee has two very important things to report. First, very happy news. Uh, as of today, I want to give a big shout out and thank you to our committee member, Kevin Fitzpatrick. He joined the committee last year and he has already earned his spurs uh, because he has secured for us our Lifetime Achievement Honoree for this year. Author, autobiographer, raconteur, political candidate, and Irish American legend Mr. Malachi McCourt is going to be our Lifetime Achievement honoree. He is the last surviving member, no sibling, of you know, the, his generation of the McCourt family. And what pleases me about this, other than simply the fact that obviously, you know, he's a great choice and it's gonna be wonderful to honor him, but of course, it's no secret that publicity for the Gannick Apple Awards has been one of our biggest challenges. And there is, of course, an entire community of Irish American newspapers, periodicals, you know, Irish Times, Irish Central, et cetera. And in that community, the McCourt siblings are heroes. So I'm very, very happy about it. And I want to thank Kevin Fitzpatrick very much for uh, getting, uh, getting Mr. McCourt for us. So there will be more about that, of course, during the publicity campaign as we go. Um, now, the other thing that I need to remind everyone of, please, is to vote for the pre-nominations. Uh, the pre-nominations are what decide who the nominees will be, who the candidates for each award, you know, that we open up the envelope for will be. For instance, we just had two fabulous speakers. Both of them have websites that pertain to our industry. If either one of them was to receive a pre-nomination for Outstanding New York City website, or for that matter, Outstanding Achievement in Support of New York City Tourism, they could be considered. If nobody puts forth these names for the pre-nominations, they will not be considered and not wind up in the final four. So if you were as impressed as I was Go to the poll and nominate people. Uh, Jeremy Wilcox, who was a member of our committee. Well, that's no surprise he's a member. Is there any committee that Jeremy's not a member of? 
you know, he's like that movie Rushmore. But anyway, uh, he's terrific. And he um, kind of bumped up the um, mention of the pre-nominations on the Gannick uh, members Facebook page, uh, where you can go straight to the, um, you can go straight to the poll from there. I just saw the question. Yes, this is the one kind of voting that provisional members are allowed to do. I know we drive it through everyone's heads that when you're a provisional member, the one thing you're not allowed to do is vote. On the awards, you can vote even if you are not a full member, but only a provisional member. So yes, please go ahead and vote uh, for your pre-nominations uh, for the Apple Awards. Um, now, uh, Jeremy, I'll double check with him as to whether he also posted the link again or, you know, brought it back up to the front uh, on the forum in the Gannick website, because I know that not everybody is on Facebook, even if most of us are. Um, but this will be until the end of this month. Uh, October 31st is the last day for pre-nominations. So now is the time. And I think that's all I have, except I, I saw, you know, questions fast and furious in the chat there. Uh, yes, full and provisional members. Uh, and yes, they close on October 31st. So that's, that's me for tonight. <laughs> Any questions, specific questions from Matt? We could put um, in, yeah, so October 31st, the link is right there. Um, we can, uh, Send out another blast with the with the pre nomination link. Um, if you'd like, Matt, we'll we'll have that um, send out to everybody, to all members. And um, great, I liked your little hint. So my little hint. Yes, about our speakers. Oh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Yes. Wink, wink. Yes, very good. All right, cool. All right, if that's if that is it. Okay, yep, that's it. All right, thank you very much, Matt. I will now bring in Nina, who will be speaking for education. So hold on a second. Let's get Nina and then. Oop, I do not see Nina. Is Nina not here tonight? Is education was presenting, but I don't see Nina in the in our list of attendees. Does anyone have the, do we have the education report that someone else would like to present it? Uh, let me see. Hold on a moment. Madam Chair, she will be sending her report later. She only provided an outline at this time. Okay, do, do you think the outline's enough to inform everyone, Patrick? Sorry? Would the outline be enough to inform everyone or we'll just read it? Uh, no. Okay. No, just the big event was the cooperation between DC Guild mm -hmm. and Gannick. Uh, from an educational point of view, but that is it for now, and she has okay. not provided any details in the report. All right, then we'll if, have we'll get Nina's report, and it will be posted with the yeah. minutes um, for for everyone else. Okay, so government <laughs> relations. So that is Christina. So who's on already? So go for it, Christina. Hello, everyone. Um, government relations uh, has the following update for you guys. Um, so. As many of you are aware, we've been working for um, an extended period of time on 289A, um, the bill which would secure tour guides on all double-decker tour buses. Um, and as many of you are aware, we have a greater degree of urgency now with respect to this bill, uh, as Big Bus and a number of others have indicated that they intend to use pre-recordings imminently. We had a veto-proof majority on the city council. We now may be down one. We need volunteers to reach out to members of the city council. We're trying to target certain specific districts, but for the purposes of this conversation, any GANIC member who is interested in speaking on behalf of the bill should reach out to government relations. I will put you in touch with the city council member where we feel you'll be most effective. We're creating template documents uh, for you to email to your correspondence or a script to use when you, excuse me, your committee uh, person. When you uh, call them, we'll have a script for you if need be. So uh, please reach out to us and let us know if you're interested uh, in volunteering to talk to the city council for us.
I just put your um, the government relations email into the chat. It's easy, governmentrelations at gannick.org. Uh, anything else? Does anyone have questions for um, Christina? Uh, I'll jump in with a question for Christina. Um, was the loss of one you mentioned due to the council member who was expelled? I believe so, yeah. Okay, it was just um, curious. So if you can get one back, a different member who's on the edge, you will then once again have a veto-proof majority? Correct. Okay, that's what I was just checking. So, and we're, there's a concerted effort to, to move the bill to the floor uh, for a vote. So we're, we're right there, everybody. Just hang tight with us for a little bit longer, and we'll get this done. All right, thank you. Thank you, Christina. And um, yeah, as, as Kevin says, let's keep the government officials on the edge right there. But he, pins and needles. Okay. All right. So thank you, Christina. Industry relations. Mike, you got the floor. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so uh, just a couple of quick things. First of all, thanks. Uh, big thanks to Kit Garrett and to Harvey Davidson, uh, who really were the driving forces between, between, behind facilitating the free ticket offer that we had from Top of the Rock. Uh, everybody should have received their tickets in the mail who were able to sign up for the program. And uh, we hope you've been able to take advantage of this as the weather has been so beautiful. Um, quick update on Tour Your Own City. I know Emma mentioned it in her remarks. We have 117 tours up on the site. Uh, we continue to try to get the word out and certainly can use any and all help with that in terms of any contacts you might have in the media or bloggers or anything like that. Uh, plus keep hitting the social media. Um, and uh, we're going to keep promoting this as much as we can to hopefully, if nothing else, raise the profile of touring in New York, but hopefully to give you guys uh, some direct connections to clients, those of you who are participating uh, in the program. Um, wanted to talk to you for a second about another program that NYC and company approached us about. Harvey and I had a telephone call with several um, NYC and company officials and they are working with MasterCard on what's called priceless experiences. And they reached out to Gannick, uh, NYC and company did, to see uh, if we could find um, guides to develop, uh, curate custom itineraries of attractions slash events slash eateries uh, in each borough. So kind of one per borough is what they're thinking, but if it goes well, they might uh, open it up more um, to that. Now, uh, more to more than just one per borough. Now, this is a little bit different than a traditional tour, at least how they're envisioning it right now, because right now MasterCard is only promoting virtual events, but they're looking to curate some kind of smaller uh, experiences that can be socially distant and safe in-person experiences. So the idea that they had is basically using your contacts in, in, uh, in a particular neighborhood, uh, and the example they sent to me, uh, what they were thinking was Arthur Avenue, um, you can contact uh, vendors who you work with and put together almost like a virtual tour where people can follow along and uh, say, you know, on Arthur, Arthur Avenue, uh, hit up some of the great eateries there. So, for example, get um, coffee at Serini Coffee and Gifts, get uh, cannoli filled on the spot at Arturo's uh, or fresh mozzarella from Casa della Mozzarella. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is that perhaps you would meet the, the, the clients first just to kind of get them oriented, provide them with a map, e either printed or digital, and then uh, they would kind of be on their way. So the nice thing about this is, you know, it's, it's not something once it's up and running that, that would require a lot of your time, um, but it's not gonna be a traditional tour in that you're not gonna be spending two hours uh, with these uh, folks. So. A um, couple of other things about it, and we'll send out an email blast in the next couple of days. We're still finalizing some of the details, but uh, it needs to be a, a, an itinerary that is custom for MasterCard cardholders. Now, does that mean it can't be anything like a tour that you offer on your site? No, there can be a lot of similarities, but it should just be some customization for MasterCard cardholders. Uh, it must accommodate a minimum of two participants. Uh, you must be willing to sign over global marketing permissions to NYC and company and MasterCard. Uh, and uh, the folks at NYC and company can fill you in a little bit more about that as you go along, uh, if you apply and you're accepted. Uh, and the great thing about this is MasterCard and NYC and company doesn't take a cut at all. 
100% of the revenue will come to you uh, via directly via MasterCard. Um, and there'll be more details both in our email blast uh, as well as um, if you apply. Uh, and you can apply through the NYC and Company website. I'm going to put this link in the chat box if anybody wants a head start. This will go directly to NYC and Company, uh, who will then forward you know, uh, ideas on to MasterCard. It is ultimately MasterCard's choice who they want to go with. It's not Gannix, it's not NYC and Companies, it is MasterCard's. So uh, check out the site. You can kind of get a feel for what they're looking for. But um, our contact at NYC and Company, Jackie Lavarnway, um, I hope I pronounced her name correctly. She said they're open to other types of things other than what I just described. So not traditional tours per se, but kind of these um, other experiences that you can have. I'm sorry, I'm getting a Facebook call at the moment. I apologize for that. Um, if you guys hear that, I'm just going to ignore that for the moment. Um, I'm just about done anyway. Um, so yeah, check out that link and we'll send out an email blast in the next couple of days with more on that. So, uh, let's see, was there anything else? Um, do, 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 do. sorry, I'm just scanning down through my report here. And of course now my computer is freezing up. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, those were the two main things. We're also, uh, going to look to have a virtual community meeting within the next couple of weeks. So look out for an email about that. And if you actually, um, if you're interested in joining the committee, shoot me an email at industryrelations at gannick.org. Um, and that's really all I have for tonight. Great. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. That's really good. And I'm, t I'm guessing that with the, the MasterCard, I know because we did a, our, our MasterCard tours at the um, at One World where you had to pay for them with the MasterCard. That's the big thing. They just want people using their MasterCard. So. Right. This will be marketed directly to MasterCard card holders only. Yeah. Um, and by the way, they also suggested a price point. If you think this is an, uh, you know, not worth your time, a hundred to $200 per person is their sweet spot for these experiences. <laughs> so. My sweet spot. <laughs> yes. Um, so, I mean, these are not tours of 50 people. These are for families and things like that. But if you get a family of four at $200 a pop for, you know, basically meeting them and pointing them towards where they're going to take this, uh, you know, special, you know, walk, um, you know, that's not a bad payday. So definitely something worth checking out. And they approached, NYC and company came directly to us to promote it. Obviously, it's on their website. It's not just for Gannick, but they thought very much it would be a cool thing to pitch to MasterCard but they have the Gannick guides on board. So uh, check it out. If you have any questions, you can come to me, but um, more likely you're better off posing the question to the contact on that website that I just uh, posted in the chat. Great, thank you so much, Mike. That's really, really exciting. Thank you very much. Okay, our, our next is Derek for membership. So Derek, take it away. All right. Hello everybody, it's uh, Derek Chen, your membership committee chair. And first of all, I just want to welcome everybody who's attending this meeting for the very first time, whether you're a member or not. And um, if uh, you have, um, and if you are a member, well, welcome back. And if you have the meeting before. Um, I do want to recognize uh, three new provisional members that we have, Jerry Jastrab, Antonio Ragone, and Richard Soden. So welcome. And as an update, as far as our current membership, we currently have a total of 382 members, which is the most that we've had uh, so far this year. So welcome all those uh, 382 members. As far as uh, the committee updates, um, we are considering planning for another Gannick virtual happy hour. The format will be a little bit different than past ones, so stay tuned for that. And then also, we are planning on ordering the next round of Gannett Guide name badges, the one that I have. A number of our members already have them as well. So if you haven't already ordered one and you do want to, uh, the order will be placed um, sometime next week. The deadline to get into that order is going to be this Friday, October 10th, 2020. So um, be sure to do that. And you can order on the website. I'm going to put the link into the chat. Uh, it's just scanic.org slash benefits. You'll have to uh, make sure that you're logged in to be able to access that. And uh, that's it for the committee. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Derek. Any questions for membership? Anybody have questions for membership? And you can see Derek put in the, the name badge. So make sure if you, if you want a name badge, get your order in um, this week and then he can send it off. Okay, and they're nice. Oh, well, mine's upstairs, sorry. But I like my, my name badge. And they've got really good magnets actually, which is handy when, when you're out of, when I can't find my magnet and need to stick it onto a building. Okay, all right, so that's it for our committee um, reports. Thank you, Derek. I'm going to uh, make you back to an attendee. So um, hold on a moment. I'll just do that quickly. Okay. All right, there we are. So um, is there any new business that anyone needs to discuss? If there's any incredibly pressing question. Okay. Oh, somebody asked about the Time ticket, and, oh, this is for the Rockefeller Center ticket. Okay, so I can answer that actually um, for you, Mike. The um, Rockefeller Center tickets, You, everybody who got their physical little passes, you just go to the will call desk, you just walk up to the will call desk, and you say, I'd like to go upstairs. And you either say now, or I want to go upstairs in 45 minutes, or I want to go upstairs tonight. You just tell them when you want to go, and they will give you a ticket for that. It doesn't have to even be the Gannick member because I gave my tickets to my daughter and to her friend for Mountain Day for Smith. And so they went up together. Nikki took the ticket. She brought my, um, she brought my ID with her in case she had to say where it came from. They didn't even ask. They just, no questions asked. She just presented it and, um, and that was it. So it was super easy. And she went at like 11 and they wanted to go get lunch or something. And they went up at two. There was no line. There was no problem at all. Okay, so so it was a great thing. And so thank you so much to Harvey and Kit for, for doing that. All right, anything else? Anything from the board? Do any of our board members have anything pressing to say? I don't think so. I think we're all set. Is everybody ready to pregame for tonight? I should have wanted to add uh, <laughs> uh, one thing really quickly before we leave is remember that <laughs> October is our final month of the fiscal year. So we will be getting um, membership renewals on November 1st. Basically, you do not have to do anything until you hear from us on November 1st, but I'm just giving everybody a reminder that the start of our next fiscal year is coming up soon. Mm -hmm. And as a part of that, if you are a committee chair and you have to be reimbursed for anything that you spent over the past um, fiscal year, get that in so Jeremy can put it onto last year's budget instead of taking new you know, money out from you, from your this year's budget. Okay, that's it, right? Okay. Cool. I think we're good. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. It was a really great. Oh, and one thing. Oh, yes. And don't forget the Met Tours. They're starting tomorrow. Kevin's first fam tour, um, Fantasian. Fantasian. The Asian collection at the museum, which is great. And yeah, Kevin, you want to just do a little plug for your... Well, and then Emma will take us to the cloisters. We'll and she'll tell us how it can be accessible to... Yeah, that's a tight spot. I know the port <laughs> yeah. that they had to go through. It was built in a different century, so. Yes, yes definitely. But anyway, right. great to join us. We got lot Alice Hunsberger is going to be doing the Islamic collection. We've got Matt Apter doing America. We got uh, Robin Gar, an artist herself, is going to be doing drawings and prints, and Jonathan Turr, who is just Jonathan Turr. So we'll have Jonathan <laughs> All right, so join us. So Bye that'll guys. be a lot of fun. Okay. All right. And if you want to do one, if you're dying to give a tour, a virtual tour of the Met, contact Kevin and he'll put you on the list. All yeah. right. Yeah. And also, if you just want to do one piece, we would love to have just like a collective of, of guides who we often take people to the, you don't have time to do the entire Met. Who does, right? And so, but there's one piece that you always want to bring people to, maybe have a connection to you, your family, to New York City, something that you, you know, so... We want to do one that's going to be sort of these collective types of things. So I'd love to hear from all of you. All right, cool. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin. All right, everybody. Well, thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the show. Enjoy the fireworks. Thank you all. And we'll see you the next go round. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Bye now. Bye.